What's up, guys? Welcome back to Storytime with Uncle John, where I pull tales from tech support and malicious compliance stories from around the web and mostly Reddit. So anyway, today's stories are about malicious compliance. They're very upset and annoyed right now because I made them move. So now one's going to lay almost on the keyboard. <laughs> Let me move that for you. And the other one's just going to lurk around behind me somewhere. Oh, well. Let's get into the stories. Only do my own duties? You got it, boss. I used to work in a workshop where sheds were produced for farms and businesses. I was brought on as a general laborer whose tasks were to clean and maintain the yard and workshop, clean and spray steel, and to load up the truck with any completed sheds. When I first joined the company, there were three other workers there who had their own jobs to complete. One person's job was to make flashings for the sheds, one person would run the saws and fabricate any plates and cleats needed, and then there was a welder. Slowly but surely, the other workers began to quit due to finding better paying jobs in different companies, and eventually I was the last worker there who had to run everything by myself, which I had no issue in doing, as I prefer to be able to work by myself. So one day I needed welding wire, and normally it would have been the boss's job to go and pick up any materials or supplies I needed, but on this day the boss was away, delivering a shed, so I went out of my way to go and pick up the welding wire myself so I could get a job finished that was behind schedule. But issues arose when I informed the boss that he needed to pay me back for the wire as I had to pay for it out of pocket, but I was told that I shouldn't be doing anything that's not written in my contract and that I won't be getting the money back for the wire as he never agreed to pay for it. So I went back to my original duties that I had when I first joined the company. After a few days of this, he came into the yard screaming at me as there was no sheds being manufactured and I told him that he better get hiring as I won't be doing anything out of my job's description like he stated for me to do. After two weeks of this, he hired a new worker who had no idea how to do anything, and he tried to get me to train him, but I wouldn't as that was going out of my job's description. This went on for about three weeks before the company ended up going into liquidation due to the boss failing to file accounts for the past four years. I can understand companies wanting you to stay within your, your job duties. In fact, I would prefer it that way most of the time. I also understand that some small companies, there has to be some flexibility, but usually that's worked out in the beginning. Listen, here's your basic job duties and usually somewhere in writing and, in, you know, verbally there's added somewhere and other duties as needed, you know, because they need you to cover or, you know, sometimes one department's a little backed up. So everybody kind of shifts a little bit to help, you know, catch everything up and then shifts back. But if it wasn't worked out ahead of time, then it's kind of on you about the wire thing, although they should still pay you back or take the wire home with you, uh, see if you can return it or whatever, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, if they wanna be that strict about it, then, you know, it's on them. And it's amazing how the boss wanted to jump your ass about stuff, but he couldn't even do his own job, so. Landlord doesn't want me to use AC in Phoenix? I rent a room in suburban Phoenix. The landlord lives with me. We've been getting highs of around 110 and lows of 90. I work in the evenings at a factory while my landlords work during the day. I've been setting the AC at a comfortable temperature of 85 during the day, but my landlord stopped me from doing so. He said that using the AC at 110 costs too much and damages the AC unit. I told him I'm happy to pay extra, but he wouldn't budge. What's more is that my landlord himself turns on the AC when he arrives home and sets it to 70. He says that since it's only 90 outside, it doesn't cost much or damage the unit. Now, I grew up in Sudan without AC. I know a lot of survival tricks, but these are best suited for stone houses, not furnished and carpeted ones. However, I care more about my landlord's wishes than his house. Here's what I do. I walk around with a wet towel draped around my neck and the water gets onto the carpet and might eventually cause odors, but I must abide with my landlord. During daytime, I sleep by wetting my t-shirt. The water gets into the mattress and might eventually ruin it, but I must abide with my landlord. I open the windows and hang a wet mesh to let a cool breeze in. It might damage the windowsill and attract some bugs, but hey, the company is nice. I also take long cold showers throughout the day. The cherry on top is that I got this room off Craigslist and didn't sign a lease. It's all cash and the landlord only has a bond of $100, which he'd probably never give back even if I left the house in immaculate condition. I think I'm going to just bail if he ever catches on. Well, with no lease, you kind of both screwing each other here, but whatever, man. I mean... If, if y'all kept the AC around between 75 and 80, honestly, the 110 temperatures, actually, I shouldn't say it wouldn't damage, it could damage it, but from my experience, if you make a little shade, like a, almost like a canopy over the air conditioner unit, you got to leave enough space above it so that you're not cutting off, you know, airflow in or out of the AC condenser unit. But if you build a canopy over it for shade, 
that helps a ton. Uh, so, I mean, really, the guy's being ridiculous. I just don't understand. If you're willing to pay extra for the extra electricity and stuff like that, why it would be such an issue for him. But especially if you're keeping it at 85 and he sets it for 70. But, you know, butthole is going to butthole, I guess. Remove our authorization limits? Okay. I'm not 100% sure if this clears the bar for malicious compliance or whether it's just senior management suffering the outcome of their own decisions. I was a project manager working in a multi-million pound business where the single-use products were typically 100,000 plus. The items typically sat in stores for decades until required or they eventually became life expired and had to be disposed of. My remit was a slightly unusual one within the company as I was responsible for the post delivery support for which there wasn't a great deal of need given the nature of the items. The bulk of the work was taking randomly selected units out of store and destructively testing them to check that they were aging as expected and inferring from those results that all the rest of the stock were still sound and fit for use, if required in an emergency. However, very occasionally items did get damaged during storage. Special tools were lost or someone drove a very heavy tracked vehicle over them. Our group was tasked with servicing these small value orders. To enable us to do this, one other person and I were authorized to produce quotes up to a value of $1,000 without us needing to go through the full commercial approval process. We just had to keep the sales and finance departments informed. The oversight was maintained when and if the quote was accepted and a formal purchase order raised. The full approval process was designed for the main company tenders and required a detailed breakdown estimate of man hours and bought out equipment, a cash flow analysis, risk register, milestone payments, etc. The value of these contracts was usually in the tens of millions and hence required a formal review and sign off by the MD or finance director as a minimum. The MD of our firm moved on to greater things within the corporate group and rather than promote from within, corporate parachuted a new guy in who was known to be hot on financial control. One of his very first acts was to cancel my ability to sign off minor orders. Instead, he insisted that they go through exactly the same process as everything else, which I could sympathize with, but the data pack required was completely and utterly over the top for our minor orders. We did petition the MD to be allowed to produce a streamlined data pack and a relaxation on director level sign off, but this was rejected. It was at this point that we may have drifted into malicious compliance. We started to produce the full data packs for every little order as required. We did, however, consciously make no attempt whatsoever to group like items together or encourage customers to do the same. We made no attempt to make the new edict work in any sensible way. Instead, everything was done separately. The customer needs a new O seal because one has split or been damaged, 12 page data pack detailing the whole shebang, and then a meeting with the MD or finance director to obtain the sign off. It became an informal competition to see who generated the lowest value order requiring a sign off. I should also point out the standard terms of the existing support contracts precluded the cost of bidding being included in these orders. I'd like to say that sense was seen and a streamlined sign-off process adopted, but it wasn't. The MD just told us to stop bothering him and rely solely on the finance director for sign-off instead. It was still going on over two years later when I left. Uh-huh. What are you doing? So anyway, <laughs> I guess I'll talk through the cat. <laughs> eh, there's a fly that got in here somehow. Go chase the fly guess not. So anyway, I don't understand why. I mean, I do understand middle management always seems to do this. And when they come in fresh and new and they, they really don't have any familiarity with the department or the company itself, they tend to want to showboat and, you know, prove themselves by setting new standards and, you know, tightening the reins and keeping budgets under control and things like that. Really what you did was you made things more expensive because you just complicated the process. So Anyway, all right, next story. I said I can't work there. So I'm not sure if this counts as malicious compliance, but I'll post it here for now. At my previous job, I worked as a peer trainer. Essentially, I was required to do my assigned job to its full capacity while also teaching everything to the newbies straight off the street. Not only did I agree to do this, I had volunteered for it. So this isn't a story about overwork. I worked in a large room where there were five stations of machines all lined up in a row from one wall to the other. All stations do the exact same thing, just with their own bugs and hiccups. One wall wasn't even a wall, but a giant window that looked into the break room. I had major anxiety about being snuck up on or watched without my knowing, enough to cause sudden anxiety attacks that can last for hours or until I can remove myself from the room or building and then sleep it off. I hate it, it's super inconvenient. Thankfully, this isn't an issue for the most part because since I know the triggers, I can avoid them or set up precautions. 
like sitting with my back to a wall, and my coworkers are usually understanding and don't sneak up on me. This window also proves to be a distraction for the trainees because they'll try to look for and interact with their friends who are in the break room. I get that the job I was training them for was boring as heck, 12 hours long and on the night shift, but we were working on large machines that needed to be watched at all times in case they jammed or broke, which was quite often. Thankfully, my station was the third one away from the window, so I could easily keep everything maintained. The problem was, as it always seemed to be in these stories, when a new supervisor moved to our area of the building. He was put in charge of Station 1 and Station 2. I'm assigned to Station 3, and technically speaking, Station 1 was supposed to be the training station. I had previously made a verbal agreement with his predecessor and the training team that I could stay on number 3 because of the previous points. Without asking or even giving me a heads up, I came back to work from a vacation day to find that I had already been reassigned to Section 1, despite the protests of my coworkers in my absence. Not to be that person, but there was a reason the training team was so willing to bend the rules for me. I was really good at my job. I was the go-to person to ask when something broke and even the maintenance couldn't fix it. I've been told by my own leads that they refused to let me transfer off their team without my existence. So a sudden and unprompted transfer like this was commonly considered extremely rude and was usually used as a punishment. I figured that, as I had never met this new super before, I would just go talk to him and strike up the same deals I had with all his predecessors for four years. I even had the lead for Station 1 come with me to confirm my case and act as a witness. She knew me well as an operator because I'd come over to help her fix her machines all the time. I quickly realized that he wasn't going to budge on the transfer, so I told him calmly that I was ready to quit being a trainer that day and to have the extra pay cut off immediately. It's not like I was going to lose my job, and the trainer pay was less than a dollar more an hour. I was doing this because I wanted to, not because I needed it. He was shocked. We eventually agreed that I'd finish training my current trainee in my area while he looked for someone else and until my request to quit training made its way to payroll. Cool. Apparently not cool. He came back three days later saying, with no proof or paper, claiming that HR said I had no choice. This bothered me for a few reasons. First, he didn't call me into a meeting for this. He, despite my many warnings to him about my anxiety triggers, snuck up behind me with a group of supervisors to deliver the order. Second, none of the supervisors with him were actually ones in charge of me in any capacity. My lead, direct supervisor, or any of the training team that I was under were not there. I want to make this clear, this man was not my boss in any way. He was assigned to the training section, yes, but had no authority over the trainers as trainers. So if a trainer was operating on a different section, he had no authority. The third thing that bothered me was that instead of looking for a new person like he promised, he took the time to find a way to force me to do what he wanted. As soon as he and his group appeared out of nowhere to quite literally surround me and block me in, I could already feel that stupid fight or flight kick in. I could barely keep my brain together enough to actually register what they were telling me. I could only agree in hopes that it would get them to leave sooner, hoping that I might be able to calm myself down and get in control again. I really hate causing a scene. When they left, I went to break before I moved to section 1. Finally, this is where the malicious compliance comes in. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't calm myself over break. So when I went back and moved to sit beside the giant window, the added anxiety of that hit me pretty hard, just like I had warned. So I decided that since this came with a full and repeated warning from my end, I wasn't going to do anything to mask the anxiety attack this time. I don't have them often and usually do my best to minimize the burden they cause to the people around me. This results in a few silent tears and lots of fidgeting and, and a bit of pacing. This time, however, I just let it happen. We're talking rapid, frantic pacing, red-faced and tears streaming down my cheeks, strained breathing and digging my nails into my arms and hands. My poor trainee had no idea what was going on and I was unable to teach her anything because I'll go into non-verbal when my anxiety acts up, which means I'm completely useless as a trainer. When my coworker got back from his break, a prior trainee of mine and an old sweetheart, he covered me so I could go home. After a few calls and texts to my leads and coworkers, I used up some PTO and didn't come back until I was no longer officially a trainer and could transfer back to my area. That supervisor was fired a few weeks later due to multiple complaints on top of being caught in the act of effing a coworker inside the building. She got fired too, much to the joy of everyone else. She was a Karen and snuck up and yelled at two of my very young and nervous trainees for following orders she didn't understand. Honestly, they're a match made in hell and I hope they ended up happily together so no one else would have to suffer their attention. I can't really relate to what this OP has gone through. I have anxiety issues, but not quite to that extent. Uh, I do like to sit with my back to a wall and, you know, so I can see entrances and exits and things like that. But that's that's a whole different thing. Uh, I don't usually freak out outwardly in crowds and things like that. But I've been known to kind of get a little scrambled when uh, when there's too much noise and crowd stuff going on around me. 
but I can usually get myself out of that situation. But I can't even relate to what this guy's going through. I also can't relate to what the supervisor was doing. Why would you come in and just totally upend a whole department like that? Again, I already know the answer. It's kind of rhetorical. Middle manglement, just doing what they do best. I wonder if in some way, his swapping things around and moving people, shuffling them around, I wonder if that in some way facilitated in him being closer to Karen so they could go off and do their thing. Anyway, well, I hope you enjoyed today's stories, guys. And if you did, do me a favor, click all those little buttons down there and see what they do. And until the next one, we'll see you.